FIG Ministry presents the Catholic Influencers Podcast. Join me, Alyssa Aegis, and my co-hosts, Georgia Ban and Father Rob Gallia, as we break open the upcoming Sunday Gospels and discuss relevant topics and life issues from a Catholic perspective. For a shorter, more reflective explanation of the Gospels, be sure to check out our sister podcast, Catholic Influencers, Father Rob Gallia Homilies. Third Sunday of Lent and welcome back. It's uh, so good to have Georgia here with us. How are you doing, Georgia? I'm really well, Father Rob. How are you? I'm doing well. It's a nice, beautiful weather here. I Mm. can't believe we're reaching the end of summer and still no no real sunny days. eh? It's just been... We've had a few, but it's been really nice. I'm really enjoying the weather now. It's been beautiful. The sunshine just makes you feel better, doesn't it? It does. It's so beautiful. I've been walking about five kilometers a day with the dog. Um, and I've been, I've really been loving that. And so has my dog, of course. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, Do I you saw have your a... schedule on Instagram and I was like, it's inspiring. <laughs> uh, my schedule. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm experimenting with it. So b- part of that is to wake up at 5 a.m. and to take the dog for a walk. But I've had to change a few things because just yesterday I took the dog mm. for a walk at 5.30 a.m. And there was this massive, like massive kangaroo in oh. our path. And my, my dog obviously freaked out, not, not barking, but he freaked out, like ran towards me, terrified, seeing this Aww. muscular um, kangaroo hop, hopping, like he stood up straight when it, saw, when it saw myself and the dog. And I thought, nah, nah, I'm not going to risk this because we think of kangaroos as nice and cute, but they can be savage. They, oh, can, yeah. they, they don't like dogs at all. And so, oh, yeah, so I think I need to reschedule that, see whether I can take my dog for a walk after I come from the gym. Yeah, because it's, it's more like daylight. sunrise and sunset that they come out. Like, yeah. I nearly hit one the other night. I was driving and the sun was setting and it sort of jumped out and went, oh, scary. Yeah, yeah. So you have to, bring, yeah, they're dangerous. I've, I've um, hit kangaroos twice with my car. Oh, you have? Anyway, for those of you, yeah, twice. So once, like, my car was total, like, total destruction. God. And the second time was a lot of damage. We're, anyway, those of you who are not in Australia probably think that, Kangaroos are cute and cuddly and nice, but then <laughs> they're, not. they're not, not from our experience anyway. <laughs> no. But thank God for all of his creatures. Very strong as well. You know, do you know there are more kangaroos in Australia than there are people? What? Yes. So the population of kangaroos is bigger than the human population. That's crazy because I remember my American friends used to say, oh, you have kangaroos jumping around in your front yard. And I'm like, no. But mm-hmm. now that I've been living more up in the country, they are literally They are jumping. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I have to clean their their poo from my driveway nearly every morning. So they are actually in my front yard. But I'm in a new development area. So, uh, yeah, you'd expect that. They won't be here for long, unfortunately, though. Or maybe fortunately. If they're there know. for mass, they'll be holy kangaroos. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is so good, so awesome that we um, today are going to talk about this. This third Sunday of Lent, we're going to talk about, go to John. While we're, yeah. we have been for the last few weeks, months, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the book of Mark, and now back to John, mm-hmm. which is interesting. It's called the book of signs, John. I love the, the, the book. Um, John wanted to convert people. His intention of writing this gospel was to convert the Gentiles to help mm-hmm. people understand the love of God. And so we'll, we'll take this into a, a little perspective um, very soon. And, and you can see this is in, in this gospel, Jesus' love for the Gentiles, for the non-Jews, as well as the Jews mm-hmm. who um, come to know him, to love him, and eventually to serve him post-resurrection. Already complicated, but we'll, it we'll is, come to it's this. It is, it's a big gospel. It's good, but it's good. We'll try and simplify it. Georgia, this will be your part of your job as well today. If mm. I get too complicated, <laughs> just look at me I, and tell me, Rob, Father Rob, you're, 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 yeah, slow down. <laughs> slow down, dude. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down, Father Rob. <laughs> Put the Bible down. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, I'll say it if it's getting too much. Head yes, explosion. It, uh, feel free to tell me to explain because I, sometimes I get carried away, I get enthusiastic and then I, I end up, uh, I hope I don't end up too complicated, but sometimes, yeah, I tend, I, I suppose I can. Are you going <laughs> to proclaim the gospel for us? Yes. So this is John chapter yes. 2, verses 13 to 25. Yes. Over to you. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of money, charged changes, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body and he was raised from the dead. His disciples recalled what he had said. They then believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at at the Passover festival, many saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Amen. Amen. And a, a very, like, beautiful beautiful reflection of of the love of god which we don't see in plain sight we don't Mm. really see it because um we don't understand and this is why this is uh, honestly this is why we have the podcast because we want you to understand the context of this now when you look at this at first glance you don't see that this is all about jesus loving the gentiles jesus loving the poor jesus loving those who are oppressed and exploited, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And this is why we need to go get deep into the heart, the mind, the understanding of Jesus. And please bear with us, Georgia and myself today, as we try to explain this to you, try to explain the context. And as you know, for those of you who have been following this this. A podcast, we use a, a method called the historical critical method, which tries to explain things in the mind and the heart. So if you were there, how would you have understood it? Because that is the way it should be. It's your responsibility to, to study the word of God, to know the word of God. Otherwise, it can so easily be misinterpreted. Mm. So let's start. Context. Let's go into the context of this. So mm. wh- who, who would have been at this Passover feast? Okay, so it was there was Jews at this Passover feast, there was believers, and there was Gentiles. So this was a huge feast, a Jewish feast, the Passover. The Passover that um, this is one of the first times in the Gospel that it's um, in the Bible it's actually mentioned, and many people would come. Two point five million people would be there. It was a, it was there was so many people. the The temple was filled with people, and it was something that everyone wanted to be a part of. Not just exactly. believers, that's right. Not just believers, that's right. So it wasn't just the Jews, but mostly Jews, okay? Because any any Jew who was a male, who was over the age of 19, had and lived within a 15-mile radius of this, uh, what's that, 22, 25-kilometer radius of the, of the temple, needed, mm-hmm. had to, was required to go to the temple mm-hmm. every Passover. Mm-hmm. So they were required to go to offer sacrifices if necessary, but they had to to go. Now, also, there were another group of people who were also Jews, but they were in the diaspora. So the diaspora means that they were spread out, that they went out of the promised land, okay, and they moved across different nations. One, because AD 70, after this was written, there was the, the dropping of the temple, Um, Also before that, um, the people started to spread out, go across the world, the known world at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was everyone's dream, everyone's dream of every Jew's dream to at least once in in their lifetime to visit the temple. Like it Mm -hmm. should be for, I think, every Catholic, every Christian to visit the Holy Land. And as it is for in our Muslim um, friends, you know, they, they go to Mecca um, if they within within a certain distance, they go every year. But it is every person who has the means, dream, and also requirement to at least once in a lifetime go to visit Mecca. Yes. And so this is the way it was as well for the Jewish people to go to visit the Holy of Holies. Mm-hmm. So it was a massive. But to get in, they they needed something like they they couldn't. Could people just walk into the to the temple? 
No, there was a temple tax. Mm. So there's an entrance fee. There was an entrance fee, which is, yeah. I mean, we don't have that now if I want to go to church. I have to book a ticket sometimes during this. Oh, yeah. That's COVID right. times, but you know, and we always donate money. But um, it's this was you couldn't get in unless you had this money, which meant that it excluded people, obviously, because some people couldn't afford it. Yeah, so there was a temple tax, which was um, about half a shekel. So this mm-hmm. was about two days' work, okay, equivalent to two days' work, and two they had to. Uh, but the, here's the, the strange thing, and this is maybe part of what upset Jesus was that um, they had it had to be paid in a particular way. Mm-hmm. It had to be paid in Galilean shekels or sanctuary shekels. Now, mm-hmm. as there are now, there are many currencies. You know, you, you have euro, you have Australian dollars, US yeah. dollars, you have mm-hmm. um, whatever it is, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the, they had, people came from all around the world and they had these currencies. Now, it was unclean currency unless it was Galilean shekels or sanctuary shekels. So there were these money changes. We hear a lot about these money changes. So they would come, um, they would go to the money changers and they would change their foreign currency. Now, Mm -hmm. it wasn't only the foreign currencies that were changed by the money changers, but it was also people who had big coins. You know, like, uh, can you please break this $100 bill for me? Can you please break this $50 bill for me? And if the fee is whatever, $25, but it was equivalent to about $300, um, Australian dollars about like to get into the temple. And so, wow, so they'd have this $500 note, whatever, yeah. and they needed breaking it. So to, in order to exchange, in order to either exchange or break your money, um, you had to pay half a shekel. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that again is half, uh, uh, two days, two days, I'm uh, sorry, it was, ha- so, excuse me, it was half a shekel to get in and it was one sixth of a shekel to get it changed. Right. Okay, so that's maybe half a day's work. Okay. So there's the so if you want to break your three hundred uh, your five hundred let's say your hundred dollar bill to give it, to give you twenty five here is the money um, but um, he has ten ten dollars I don't know uh, whatever uh, probably not good to mention dollars but uh, yeah. but the thing is and then if you let's say you've broken up and you have the twenty five Galilean dollars. Mm to pay or the 300 Galilean dollars to pay you'd want Mm -hmm. your change because you gave the guy 500 a thousand but in order to get your change you were charged one third of a shekel so that's three that's a day's a day's work you were charged um this this, uh, amount as well a a day whatever to to get your change back Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of commission made by these. Now, not that it was wrong. There was nothing wrong. There's nothing, if you go to a, an exchange place when you're overseas or whatever, there's nothing wrong with getting the exchange. But if it's a monopoly, and even th- this is the, the world today, you know, th- what angered Jesus was that th- they monopolized over the, over the people and they could charge whatever they want and there was nothing being done, especially for the poor who couldn't afford two days' wages, yes. three days' wages if they had foreign coins. So it was like, an, a, in, a, in a sense, this is what angered Jesus. People who could not afford it were fleeced a, a, a big bill which they could not afford. And Jesus started to think, hey, oh, wait, this is an injustice to the poor. Yeah, so he wanted he people to, to experience God. And there was people that couldn't because they couldn't afford it. Exactly. And they, yeah. oh, if they could afford it, because they would have, they'd have spent their whole, whole life savings because people were very devout. They'd do anything. Yeah. And they would end up without food and uh, without accommodation because of these, this massive temple tax. Wow. But it wasn't only money changes. There was something else. They were selling live Those animals. <laughs> mm. They were selling so, sheep. <laughs> sheep, oxen, doves. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's talk about these. Uh, there were three types of sacrifices, okay? There mm-hmm. were the oxen, which is a cow, whatever, a bull. Mm-hmm. And then there were the sheep, which mm-hmm. is a medium-sized animal. And then there were the doves, which were the small animals. Mm-hmm. So if you were rich, what would you have bought? Oh, I'd say like definitely the sheep or the oxen. The oxen, yeah. So if you could afford mm-hmm. an oxen, hey, look at my sacrifice is better than your sacrifice. Yeah. So you, you buy this oxen. Mm-hmm. If you are ha- like a middle class, you'd buy, you'd buy a sheep. Mm-hmm. If you were poor, like Mary and Joseph, when they bought the doves, they bought you remember, the doves. they offered the doves. So they must have been poor. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at least at the time of Jesus' birth, 
Yes. And they went and offered a, a sacrifice at the temple. The, you offered, you bought this sacrifice. Now, these were, of course, really expensive. Let's talk about... Um, and the thing is, they, you couldn't just go and buy any dove. You couldn't just go and buy any cow, any oxen. You couldn't yes. just buy any sheep. It had to be, according to the scriptures, it had to be unblemished. Mm -hmm. I, perfect. Oh, that's hard, I even... <laughs> Yeah, it's like there were so there were these judges inside these inspectors, the mumchech. <laughs> the, that's a Jewish word, the mumchech that would go in and they would inspect the animals that were brought in. Mm -hmm. So it's like a dog show, you know. You come in and say, like, it, it, <laughs> if it can pass through the next level or not. You're in, so, you're out. <laughs> but think about it, you know. Yeah. Passover. One week or whatever it is, days they'd be waiting. 2.25 million people there mm. trying to get into the temple, at least one side, one part of the temple, or each part of the temple. Mm -hmm. And so they get these animals, put them in a cage, ready to walk in to offer these animals for sacrifice, which they would have spent. Again, that's another price they would have had to spend. So if you bought doves, for example, from outside, you'd be paying half a shekel. Yep. And they get in, and what happens then? The judges come towards them. Yeah, well, and they well. Are you talking about when Jesus arrives? And no, like when no. these these guys come in with with their sacrifice when they come in, mm -hmm. and they're they're waiting for three, four, five hours to get in with their sacrifice. Then these mumshech come up to them, and they can say, "Hey, I'm sorry, this is not unblemished." Yeah, right. This yes. one has an extra spot. And then, so they've just wasted all this time. <laughs> And money, yeah. And money. And so That's they have crazy. to go back out. And, uh, and it's just a hassle. It was, and they possibly wouldn't have been able to offer a sacrifice because it, the queue was too long. Mm -hmm. And But there was an alternative. If they wanted one, that what would be it? guaranteed. There, there's, there was a way in which they could guarantee that it was going to be without blemish. And how was that, Georgia? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Check it. So, so what they could do is they could buy it from the inner temple. <laughs> ah, yes, so they... yes, of course. I was making so... <laughs> sure. That's for everyone testing to see if everyone's listening, including me. <laughs> yeah, so they could buy it from the internal instead of bringing it from the outside. Yes, and that way it was guaranteed that it was mm -hmm. going to be without blemish. But you think, why, why wouldn't people do that straight away? It would save them a lot of time. Yes. But there was a problem with that. Couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it. It was six shekels, you know, from half a shekel to six shekels, 12 times the price yes. of what you'd get for outside. Yeah. That's extortion. That's mm -hmm. corruption. And people, the, the vendors who were inside, were, they'd make a lot of money and they probably were charged commission as well. And the mumchesh, the judges, the inspectors would refuse certain sacrifices so that people would buy it from the inside. Oh, they made man. it hard. They made it so hard. That's full on. And so how, what's Jesus going to say? Well, when Jesus, I mean, it's, and then this sort of, you know, goes towards our topic, but it's the first time when I remember when I was reading the Bible when I was younger, or, you know, um, just even recently again, it's the first time you see him angry. Um, and it's one of the first times that, um, it's mentioned that a temple being um, the father's house and Jesus says, you know, you can't sell things in the father's house. You can't turn the father's house into a marketplace. So he's angry at them for doing this. And you it's know. not that they were selling stuff. That's not yeah. was the, the, the problem was the extortion, was the, was the mm. exploitation, was the injustice, Justice. was taking advantage of people in the name of faith, in the name of religion, making people, guilting people and mm. manipulating people into buying stuff. And this was what made Jesus flamingly angry. Mm -hmm. um, and because he, he, want, he loved his people, he loved the poor, he loved the children of God, but... And he couldn't stand the injustice that he was seeing. And so that frustrated him. Mm -hmm. he, got him he got so angry that he started to throw over the tables. He started to, mm -hmm. to shout and tell people, are you crazy? This is what you're doing. It was never about the goods they were selling. It was never about the structure, the building that was, in a sense, being desecrated. But it was mm -hmm. always about the poor. It mm -hmm. was always about the injustice being done to the children of God. But... You see, there's more. There was more injustice. And we'll talk about that very soon. 
That's uh, Georgia. I've been talking too much. You no, can sing good. us a song. Because Tell us something. Well, we talked about this. Like, <sighs> there's so many things you can say about this gospel, and it goes in lots of different directions. So you've kind of got to choose one or two directions. Mm. Um, but a thing that I think was, you know, I sort of touched on before was that John talks about the fact in John he talks about the fact that it's it's um, the father's house. So Jesus mm-hmm. is the son of God. So the reason that Jesus is acting this way is a direct result of his relationship with God. And that these actions are not just coming from just something random. It's, you know, it kind of is, is definitely because he he's feels, he feels called to do this because he is the son of God. And he says, I will, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And as we see in the gospel, it's talking about his um, bodily resurrection. You know, he yes, yeah, he dies. And, and so there are three, three things, and that's a very clever point as well. You see, so there are three reasons why Jesus acted in this way. I, mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about what you just said now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that the irre- irrelevance, in a sense, that especially when he brings out that I will destroy the temple. So that also proves the fact that he wasn't talking about he he, he wasn't talking about the the structure of the building when he was angry because he knows the author knows john that in ad 70 just maybe 40 years after this incident happened that mm-hmm. this temple would have would be dis- destroyed mm-hmm. and so it's it's not the point but the point is that it, they were one of the things that upset jesus was that people they were teaching people that they had to buy their favor with God, yes. that they had to buy their salvation, they have to buy their purification. Mm-hmm. And and this was terribly upsetting, terribly upsetting to Jesus because in, in hindsight, like in forwards, foresight, he knew that he was to be the one sacrifice once and for all. So there was no need that, but it's not only here. In Hosea, there's constant talk about that. I, I don't look for animal sacrifices. I don't look for... Um, the burnt offerings, but I look for a contrite heart, mm-hmm. a pure heart. And this is what he wanted. And the thing is, this is exactly what was not happening. The opposite was happening. Yes. That there was an impurity of heart, uh, mm-hmm. exploitation. Mm-hmm. But let's, let's talk about it. There's three reasons. The second reason is that he would have been upset that there was no reverence in the house of, of the father. You see, the... the it's not that there was silence or not silence, but there was reverence. They, people had lost the fear of the Lord. Mm-hmm. They lost the fact that, that that God is holy and just right behind them, in front of them, was the holy of holies. They were just near the real true presence of God, like yes. we in the chapel, in the tabernacle. You know, we go, and there's the real presence of God, but yet sometimes we talk, yet we're, we're just in a place where we're distracted and God, Jesus was saying, hey, you're missing a great opportunity here. Look right in front of you. Look there beyond the oxen, beyond the doves, beyond the animal poo that's right in front of you. Mm-hmm. Look, there is the presence of my father whom I love. And, and, and God wanting to reveal himself to people. And when it was too noisy or too busy, it's, it's hard to keep Jesus as the center or God as the center, in, you know. Yes. So it was too hectic in there and that's what he was frustrated at as well. It was turning Again, it, the temple into a marketplace rather than a place of God where people can yes. encounter his love. It's, and again, it's not about the, the structure or the building. It it's, was about the fact that we need to make time for God and, and, and that was the time for God and yet we got distracted during our time for God. Maybe you go to your prayer and and you go to be quiet, to be still with God, but instead you're playing with your phone the whole time. Mm-hmm. You know, and God is saying, hey, uh, hold on, that's my time. What are you doing? Checking your Facebook. Oh, but now it's a good opportunity for me to evangelize. But hold on, that mm-hmm. time is for me. Mm-hmm. And God, in a sense, was Jesus was jealous. Like in a, in a sense, he... The scripture says that he is jealous for us. He's yes. jealous for us. He wants our attention. He wants us for, for himself. Mm-hmm. But the third thing, and I think this is so, it, it just blows my mind just to understand the heart, the empathy, and the love that Jesus has for the, the, the outcast. Mm-hmm. Now, as you know, people who pilgrim towards this, this Passover... There were the Jews who lived in Jerusalem yes. within 15 miles. There were the people who lived in the diaspora. Mm-hmm. But with them would come a lot of Gentiles, a lot of people who were not Jews, mm-hmm. but were welcome. 
but they were welcome. So they maybe they were talking to their Jewish friends and they're thinking, hey, I'd like to know more about it. Oh, well, come with me to Jerusalem. We'll go together. And then, but they weren't allowed in the same places as the others. Now on YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to show you an image, okay? So this is an image here. So this is the temple. This is how the temple was. So there was the inner side, which is the Holy of Holies, okay? Mm -hmm. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then within, straight outside of that, there was where the priests could pray. After that, the Israelites, the men, the Israeli men, could, could go and pray. Out of that is called the Court of Women, okay? So you have already you have one, two, three, four. And that's the Court of Women. The women could go there, the men could go further there, and then the priests, and then the Holy of Holies only once a year. One particular priest would go in once a year. Okay? Wow. Now, on the outside, there was the place of the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles. Anyone could go in there. Mm -hmm. That was a place where, but it was still part of the temple. Now, this was a place for people to come in to pray. If you were a Gentile and you want to know, it's like doing the RCIA, you know, in the Catholic Church. And there was a place where they could go and they could reflect, they could meditate, they could encounter the love of God. From a distance, because they're not quite yet inside the, ch the so to speak, the church, the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. but they could worship from the outside. So this was their only place to worship. But what was happening here? What was happening all over here? Well, things were being sought, um, sold, and it was like turned into a marketplace. The court of the Gentiles was the place where Jesus overthrew those tables. Mm -hmm. It was the place that was. A marketplace, a place that was so loud, mm -hmm. so distracting, there was so much exploitation. And so if this, uh, an outcast, so to speak, a Gentile whom Jesus loves so much, wanted to come in and doesn't quite fit in, but he's there and he cannot because his place of worship is exploited. Mm -hmm. His opportunity to encounter the love of God is taken over by by wild beasts and mm -hmm. uh, and money changers and the noise of coins and animals and the smell of of everything that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is furious. Mm -hmm. He's furious because, like, what about? Okay, you care about your Jews above everyone else, but what about the outcast, the poor? Mm -hmm. What about? The, the people who are on the outside who don't necessarily fit into the church. And this is and who is his heart, as we see through the Bible all the time and through the stories of Jesus and, you know, even in the world now, the way that God reveals himself to, to us. Jesus is always for, you know, the, the lost lamb, the, you know, leaving the 99 to get the one. And I think it's it just shows in this situation when you first read it, as you said, you go, oh, he's just angry because they're selling things. But once you go deeper, you realise he's upset because people aren't getting a chance to really experience God, which is what the whole re Jesus came. That was his mission and he was the son of God. And so he had to get people's hearts back to, to God yes. instead of being, you know, thinking about the wrong things. No, well, no, Pope Francis um, just two years ago wrote a document called Laudato Si. Now this got a lot of criticism because it was all about the environment and people said why doesn't Pope Francis focus on other things but the environment? Why mm -hmm. is he focusing so much on the environment? Well, I'd say it's because of this. Mm. It's because of this, you see, because this is what's happening. Take that, the temple, the um, court of Gentiles, as our world, our earth, okay? That people are exploiting it. People are... Um, extorting it there, there's so much we're taking more than our fair share and we're m manipulating it for our own good so that future generations will not be able to see to worship God people who are the Gentiles who don't have this personal relationship with God cannot find God will not be able to find the God in the beauty of this earth mm -hmm. and so again this is part of it this is part of why Jesus overthrew the tables because sometimes even as People who follow God sometimes we we uh, we extort we we exploit things for our own good and Jesus is saying hey always focus on the poor those who are suffering those who are in need um, yeah let's not use it for our own good yeah Whew. that's a yeah. lot of stuff there a lot. shall we go shall we go to um, another section. Yeah. Do you have anything more to say about this? No, I just think it's 
it's it's what was always one of my favorite scriptures because it's the first time you see Jesus getting angry on it. It sounds weird, but, but it was like, oh, there's this whole other side to Jesus because you think of him as so um, gentle and heal all the healing that he performed and everything. But I think it's good to, for me, it's like really reveals the mystery of God. Like you just, until you really draw close to God and you read scripture and everything, until you do that, it's hard to find out who God really is, you know, and mm. what God's really saying. So when you look at something superficially, like, oh, he got angry because I was selling stuff, but really there's it goes a lot deeper, which is why I think these podcasts are so good because you can go deeper. So exactly. That's it. Exactly. There you go. Next section. Okay, so let's go to the next section. Dad joke. Okay, so I have a dad joke given to us on social media by Valerian and Yappa. Yes. At Valerian and Yappa. Okay, so this here it is. Everyone told Sam not to sing, but Sam sung anyway. <laughs> Do I get a laugh? I'm not. <laughs> yes. Okay, <good. laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Okay, we had an audience laughing with us right there. I was laughing too. I loved it. <laughs> so now let's go to the next section. Three, two, one. It's time for Saint Me a Picture. That always makes me dance. Saint Patrick. Saint Ooh, tell us, tell us more. Who's Saint Patrick? I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard of Saint Patrick. Yeah, well, see, I'm Irish, fifth generation Irish, and uh, so. I was always like, well, St. Pat's my saint, you know. I went to Ireland, went to Dublin, went on a pilgrimage to Ireland. But I never knew this, that St. Patrick wasn't actually Irish. Where was he from, Father Rob? Um, So St. Patrick was from Britain, from Mm. England. Yeah, so he wasn't Irish. But he was captured and enslaved at 14 years old. And he was a slave in Ireland for a very rich man. And so he was just minding his own business and his town, all of a sudden these Irish come and they kidnap him, his family, and he becomes a slave to this master, to this guy for how many years? Six years. Six years till he was 20. Mm, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 22. I, I was just testing your maths. <laughs> he, was, he was 16 when he was captured. <laughs> and well, this guy, he was, he was... Okay, who cares? All right. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, it, look it up. We, we, we'll look it up. It could be wrong. Debatable. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah. And then eventually some, he has a dream. Mm-hmm. He has a dream and basically he escapes. So he had this dream about God and, and felt he escaped. He escaped from uh, Ireland and he went back to Britain where he was from. And then? And, and then uh, there he sort of had this, while he was um, um, a slave to his master, he converted to Catholicism. He converted and he had this encounter of the love of God, uh, not because of his master, because his master was, was cruel. Mm. But um, eventually he goes back and he becomes a priest. He becomes a monk. He goes into the monastery and he has this conversion and then he wants to convert others. So he takes, he says, okay, I want to go back to Ireland to convert everyone, to, to convert the pagans, to convert people to know, to love, to serve God. So he was an atheist, a pagan, and then eventually had this conversion. And now he wants to share this with others, which is the natural process of a conversion. Mm-hmm. And he goes out, starts monasteries, he starts building churches, he starts building a community, schools. And he and converted a lot of people a in lot Ireland. Of people. And he, then he returned one day to pay his ransom to his master. Yeah. He goes back to his master and says, because I escaped, I in my conscience, I owe you a ransom. So he goes, but anyway, long story short, he goes there and he finds the whole house on fire and the guy mm. died inside the fire. I don't know what the story of all of this is. Oh, wow. But this is, <laughs> this is I'm not, he ended up keeping the ransom, I suppose. Um, <laughs> But he's known for like taking away snakes from Ireland, but actually there were never any snakes in Ireland. So, but that's a symbol of um, getting rid of the paganism, paganism. atheism in Ireland. And His main, now St. Hmm? Pat's uh, feast day is obviously celebrated by Catholics all around the world, but it's also celebrated by so many other people, like anyone. <laughs> that we know that we celebrate St. Pat's Day, especially the Irish drink Guinness and things like that. <laughs> 
That's right. So, it, it, ironically, even the pagans, even the atheists, um, celebrate um, St. Patrick's Day. So, I, I don't know if he'll be, what, the, what do they say, they'll be turning in his grave? Yeah. <laughs> or he'll, <laughs> be, he'll be happy because, uh, I don't know, maybe. Oh, maybe, if they come to him, uh, not inebriated. But anyway, he, he was very yes. much, he wanted people to come to know, love and serve God. Yeah. So this this is um, yeah this is Saint Patrick, a mm. great saint, a saint who loves Jesus, a saint we celebrate every year, but a guy who really loved God and was sold out for Jesus. We um, so Saint Patrick, pray for us. Yes. Okay. So one part of while we're talking about saints, we have a giveaway. We Ooh. want to give a really beautiful book, actually two copies of this book called Cello et in Terra which is a, a book of the la 365 days with the saints. It's, uh, it looks like gold leafed, the book. It's just amazing. The Pauline Press, um, Pauline Press in the United States sent us these books, and we're grateful to them as well. But we want to give it to you, to you and a friend. So if you want this book, um, we'll pay shipping for you. We'll, we'll give it to you. So all you need to do is to go to at Catholic Influences underscore on social media, on Instagram, or on Facebook, Catholic Influencers, and you tag a friend and in the comment, and but you both have to be following. If you're both following, then um, you're in the draw. So you can comment, you can comment 20 times, okay? 30 times, 50 times. How many friends can I times. tag? You can tag as many friends as you like. I always um, do that on giveaways. I tag like 25 and give myself a great chance. Yes, so every tag you make is gives yourself a bigger chance of of but every an entry is only if you're both like following. Uh, following. Yeah, tag anyway, I don't know. The instructions are on the thing. <laughs> um so please go, go to at Catholic Influences underscore Cath Influences on um on Twitter, Catholic Influences if you go to uh Facebook. Ooh, okay. So Giveaways. Let's go to the topic. Oh, What's topic. our topic? Very, I like the camera here. Look, if you those very, on social media, yeah, look, it goes okay. out of focus. <laughs> topic is <laughs> anger. Anger. Ooh, we should have a. Have <laughs> is an, it good uh, or is it that. bad? That's not the topic, but that's a little yeah. bit of a you know. Is anger and acting in anger ever a good thing, or is there such a thing as righteous anger? Mm -hmm. Well, I. I always think that myself, that people just naturally go towards the negative um, kind of side of anger. So they go, it's not good to get angry, don't get angry, just say. You know, that's quite a common thing. Um, you know, calm your anger, like suppress your anger, all those things. But actually anger is um, a human emotion that we need to function. Like it's, you know, th things make yeah. us upset, things make us angry. But the main point is it's how we express it. So if we, you know, burst out, yell, um, punch, things like that and get angry um, and that affects someone in a bad way, that's obviously not what God would want. But if we allow ourselves to feel that emotion and express it in a healthier way or tell someone how something they have done or someone else has done has made us feel, then it can have a good function. So there, it can help you get towards, a, you know, a just outcome if something's unjust or that's what I would basically say. Oh, and Go that's perfect. Away. Yeah, no, that's like, seriously, th this is what it says. Like the scripture confirms everything you said, you see. There's a lot of anger in the Bible, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, anger is, is not a bad emotion. It's a good emotion. It's what we do with it, as you said. But mm -hmm. the, the Bible is full of, of people who are angry and angry before God who have righteous anger. But uh, the, then the Bible has a lot to say for those people who are hotheads, people who um, have uncontrollable anger, you see, unbridled anger, you know, like a horse that is not bridled. Mm -hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to destroy everything in front of it, okay? Mm -hmm. And it, it's destructive. So destructive anger is never, never of God, okay? So it's, it needs to be controlled, bridled, and uh, directed, and also directed towards the heart of God. The um, scripture, Proverbs 12, 16 says, Fools quickly show they are upset, but the wise ignore insults. Now, here's one thing. Like, I get a lot of amazing comments on my social media, but I get a lot of uh, mean, mean tweets, okay. mean comments, okay? I get a lot of people who 
um, criticized and a lot of people who are angry and who from people who, outside the church, but mostly from people within, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, so people who are just angry. Okay. Now, it's my f first reaction to justify myself. My first reaction is to say, hey, um, you got it wrong. You don't even know me this and then um, and to, to retaliate. But I don't. I don't. I take a deep breath. I close my laptop and I just walk. I go for a walk. And then I think about it. Usually what I end up doing is if I, I think it's unjust, unfair, I end up deleting it. Not yeah. because um, I don't want to give people freedom of speech. One, because I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I, two, I don't want other people who follow to attack this person and to be mean to this person. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I tend to delete things like that. But my first reaction is always to to be angry. But there's a process w which we, we need to do. We need to bring our anger to God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, there's a process in which we can deal with anger. So the Psalm 139, 19 to 22, Psalm 139 says this, If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me who are bloodthirsty. They speak to you with evil intents. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as enemies. What? <laughs> Just before in this verse, this is the same psalm that says that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in my your mother's womb. And then they, all of a sudden this guy just has like flips. Yeah, just choo. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that's righteous anger because what's he doing with it? He's not causing destruction. He's going to God yes. with his anger. Yes. And so this is one of the beautiful things that we can do when we're angry. Take a deep breath. One, there are four things. Okay, one, mm -hmm. take a deep breath. Count to 20. Count to 20. If necessary, close your laptop, go, go for a walk. Take mm -hmm. the dog for a walk. Take the cat for a walk. Take the duck for a walk. <laughs> Just get away. Not the kangaroo. The second, <laughs> the second thing is go to God. <laughs> go to God. Speak to God like this uh, King David. You know, tell, punch a pillow with God. Say, I'm so angry, Jesus. Help me. But let God in to that anger. Don't hide it from God. Okay, the third thing is pray for your enemies. Bless them. Whether they understand or not, just pray for their hearts. Because a lot of people speak out of bitterness. They speak out of, out of pain. Mm -hmm. Just pray for this person's pain. And number four, act with and in the heart of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. the, in other words, what would Jesus do? Yes. Yeah, maybe in some cases he would flip tables. And that's maybe it calls for it, if that's what is necessary to bring about justice, mm -hmm. if that's what's necessary to stand for the oppressed. It's good for us to be angry when the oppressed are being oppressed, when the, when the poor are not being fed. And it's good for us to act on that anger. But that should cause us not to put other people down, but to build, to to break down structures that are, are taking away the dignity and are causing exploitation of the poor, mm -hmm. of this planet around us, of the, our future generations, of the unborn, of those who are outcasts, the LGBT, whatever. We need to bring about love, peace, justice um, in, into this world and bring the love of God to this world. Mm. Yeah, it's... And things can make us angry. And, you know, I know last year during um, lockdown especially, everything changed for me. Um, my, all my work stopped and um, so I had to have some sort of way to, you know, express how I was feeling and we're in lockdown. So obviously prayer, but I started boxing because it was a really healthy way of, you know, I'd think of something I, would I was frustrated at and I would, you know, punch the bag. <laughs> and mm. it was, I got fit, I lost a bit of weight, but I also mentally was able to sort of release these things. And I think yes. prayer and exercise are really good rather than ringing up someone and going, you upset me or putting it on Facebook, I'm so upset, I lost my job or whatever, doing it in a really healthy way. that, And also if someone hurts you, instead of, you know, writing a mean text or talking about them, you know, you can use like prayer and exercise to deal with those things and come back to that person in a more sensible way. And, you know, as you said, what would Jesus do in that situation rather than yes. what our instinct, our initial instinct wants us to do? Yes, it's so easy to become a keyboard warrior. It's so easy to yeah. let out our anger, to just give in to our instinct um, of anger. But I think 
uh, not I think, we need to be people who are self-controlled, mm. people who bring our anger to God and have healthy outlets yes i exercise as well i go to the gym i lift weights and uh, and that helps me as well uh, control not only the anger in my life but every aspect of my life i believe that good exercise and disciplined exercise is is a modern day asceticism self-control death to self but that's another topic for another time that's good, okay so keep watching we've the podcast reached... and we won't tell you which week it is so you have to watch all of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So we've reached the end of our podcast here. Just a few things to remind you. We are so excited to be offering now an, a free online um, Holy Week retreat. How awesome is that? It, this is for um, everyone who would like to sign up. You have to sign up. So there are going to be some sessions um, that are going to um, Zoom sessions in the morning with myself or the FRG ministry team. We also have um, ador time of adoration online. We have the rosary. We have mass together. There's going to be a packed session, packed sessions, um, stations of the cross. Holy Week is going to be amazing. Allow your heart to be touched by God this Holy Week. So go to courses.frgministry.com forward slash register. I'm going to say it again. Courses.frgministry.com forward slash register. And also we'll have all this information on our social media at Catholic Influences underscore on Instagram, Cath Influences on Twitter, Catholic Influences on YouTube. We'd love you also to listen to our other podcast, which is my Sunday homilies. Um, uh, go to frgministry.com forward slash podcast. Yes. So many, <laughs> and, um, it's awesome. so many things to do. Um, again, send, please leave a review um, on uh, especially iTunes, Apple iTunes. Please, when you put reviews, it puts us up on the algorithm and it gets more exposure. So please, please leave re your reviews. Um, and whatever your platform is because it's going to raise us and reach, allow this to reach more people and ask us questions send us in your prayer, prayer requests dad jokes uh, keep in touch share the, our pages on social media so thank you for joining us and we'll see you again next week ciao ciao thank you